thanks for staying with us. Well, I've just been accused of traumatizing my guests to come to the studio. But she will tell you more about that this morning because we're talking about, you know, trauma and whatever the triggers are. So why is everyone saying triggered? Well, it's all about trauma and how we carry it. The expression triggered has been pasted across the internet so many times and <laughs> it's easy to forget its origin. And as psychological terms like triggers, trauma loops, attachments become part of our everyday language, <laughs> the idea of trauma only being a, a post-traumatic stress disorder diagnosis is changing. It's a word used to describe a very real and damaging reaction that experts are still researching. Well, perhaps some perspectives will help us this morning as we take home Dr. Bonjibola Abiri, who is a consultant, psychiatrist, and mental health advocate. Thanks for joining us this Thank morning. Thank you for having me. Good morning. Um, first of all, perhaps an understanding of what trauma is will help. So, well, thank you for having me. I particularly like that you started with the word trigger. Um, I think that for people to understand what trauma is, it's important to understand that trauma is a response. And before you get a response, you have a stimulus. Trauma is an emotional, psychological, physical response to a stressful or significantly life-threatening event. And so you say that trauma has happened, or there's been a traumatic life experience if an individual has an experience that is sudden, uncertain, distressing, and threatening to not just their physical, their mental, and their social, psychological well-being as well. So that's trauma. That encapsulates trauma. Trauma is a response. But before you get that response, there's a trigger mm. or a stimulus. Okay. So, so would you say, therefore, that... Uh, the death of a spouse could be traumatic to one. Definitely. And so um, different things connote trauma for different people at different ages, different walks of life. Even in our jobs, we experience trauma. I mean, the news that sometimes people, you know, cast, um, the jobs that I do, listen to people's, you know, real-life experiences, stories, um, experiences such as childbirth, even life events that we would otherwise see as happy, marriage, childbirth, the loss of a loved one. Marriage Again, could be yes, traumatic. of course it could be traumatic because you could then come, you know, to reality of to the reality of something you weren't expecting or something that you can't deal with. Remember again that it's a response to something that you find significantly stressful, distressing, and that threatens your physical and emotional well being. Mm. Um, you talked about the jobs we do. <laughs> yes. Sounds to me like you also get traumatized <laughs> listening to people. Well, so clearly the kind of trauma that we have in the um, space or the world of healthcare professionals is that which is referred to as secondary or vicarious trauma, mm. where you are traumatized listening to, watching, and engaging in some of the day-to-day, -day, you know, experiences. So dealing with patients in the emergency, watching patients die, having to tell people they've lost, lost loved ones, or listening to even the traumatic experiences that are shared with you day in, day out of otherwise, you know, people's normal lives. How, how significantly mm -hmm. do such events affect our lifestyles? All right, so it's pertinent to state at this point that not everyone who faces a traumatic life event becomes traumatized. People will react, their normal responses to trauma or to stressful life events. Okay. Normal responses which can be cognitive, affecting the mind, emotional, affecting the emotions, or physical, affecting the body. And so people will react differently. Some of these responses are normal. Like if, for instance, I heard of the loss of a patient, if I lose sleep for a few days, it's normal. But after a while, when it's becoming a week, two weeks, it's interfering with my mood, my emotions, my perception, my behavior, my productivity, my efficiency at the work front, my interactions with other people. Then we can then say that it's becoming distressing to the individual. So there are normal responses to trauma or stressful life events in general. However, 
when their intensity frequency starts to increase and they cause significant distress to the individual, then we say that it's become a problem. So how does one begin to deal with trauma? Good question. The first thing to do is to introspect and understand that we've all been traumatized and possibly that we all still undergo trauma every day. And so that awareness and that acceptance and that willingness to want to seek help for that which has gone wrong is the first step to, you know, dealing with the trauma. After accepting and being willing, you can then find a therapist who, I dare say, is better skilled in dealing with traumatic experiences mm. to walk you through the journey. Does accepting it, or can, can accepting it help you heal? Well, accepting can help you understand that there's a problem, but it may not be enough to help the individual heal because trauma has many facets and can show up in different ways, even unconsciously many times. Um, you know, sometimes the trauma that our parents experienced may even show up in our own lives in ways that they, did, they don't realize because they didn't resolve their own traumas. And so it's not enough to accept, it's not enough to identify, but to walk with a committed and trained individual who is able to show you that this is likely to be trauma. Boss, that might boss, be trauma. Boss, you said the trauma that my dad... Yes. <laughs> experience. Experience. Yes. yes. Who is now dead. Yes. Can show up in my life. Yes. When he's dead. Yes. Please explain. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll give a reference to a book, Emotional Inheritance. And what that book basically talks about is how it is that we inherit trauma from our parents, even unconsciously. Wait, emotional inheritance? Inheritance, yes. Of all things to inherit. <laughs> emotional. Yes. And so I'll tell you a story from the book, which may you know, further bring this point. Um, There's a story of a young girl in the book, Lara, who was 10 at the time she started seeing a therapist. And when she started seeing a therapist, it was that her grandmother thought that her brother was sexually assaulting her. She had no evidence, but she strongly believed that her brother was sexually assaulting her. Over years, the girl stopped therapy and then eventually came back to therapy herself. By the time she came back to therapy, it was revealed that the parents had gotten divorced because of the stress and strain that the grandmother repeatedly kept saying that her brother had sexually abused her. It was only when Lara, the girl in question, went to live with her grandmother, found out that what had happened was that her grandmother had in fact had an incestuous relationship with her own brother while growing up. Oh, God. So it wasn't that Lara and her own brother had anything, but because the grandma did not heal from her own trauma, she projected her fears, insecurities, into the life of her own grandchild, grandchild and unfortunately ruined her daughter's marriage and somehow her grandchild's life. So sometimes in the upbringing, the things parents say to children, the expectations that parents have of children, the challenges and obstacles that is, um, sometimes throw their way, unhealed trauma in parents can show up in the lives of their own children or even grandchildren. I'd like you to expatiate on that. Because there are many people watching you and listening to you right now and don't even know that these things are going on right now. Having, they are traumatized mm -hmm. by the lifestyle of their kids. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll, go, we'll come to parenting, the parenting part, but let's speak to the issue as it concerns the parents themselves now um, who are somehow consciously, subconsciously, or unconsciously affected by some of these issues that they are either unable to rationalize and it's affecting their jobs, affecting their parenting, affecting their marriage and all those things. Help us understand how that is, maybe perhaps describe some of those things so that some watching you right now might be able to relate. All right, so trauma, especially when unresolved, will always show up. It's like a demon that would show up when you turn on the lights. And so whether it is physical trauma, emotional, psychological, neglect, sexual trauma, it will show up in one way or another. I'll give you a classical example of young people who watch their parents have a go at each other. The boy and girl will say to each other, It's normal. It's normal. It's normal. But some would also say that, I promise that when I grow up, I this, this will never happen. happen. However, research has shown that we follow some of these individuals over their lives and as adults, 
they are reenacting exactly what it is that they said that they would never do. I don't know if you've seen some examples like that. For some, it's sexual trauma. And so see that story that I told, or the story of a woman who was abused maybe at age 10. You would find that when a child is around that age, she would become extremely, you know, protective, protective of the child, guarding the child. And while that is good to be protective, you, you also don't know when you are overcompensating and doing too much and, you know, affecting the individual's self-esteem, confidence, and self-worth and all of that. Trauma will always show up. Sometimes, if it's emotional trauma, mm -hmm. where you've listened to your parents tell you about how you are not good enough, how they regret ever having you, you become so extremely submissive. You become, you know, you, you, you get to the point where you, you want to be validated by other people. You want people to always see the good in you. And so if you work in an organization where the environment is toxic, it's clearly toxic, you would do just about anything to get, you know, your boss to say anything about you. And even if your boss puts you down, because it is what you grew up seeing as normal, unfortunately, yeah. you will take that toxicity. So trauma will show up in different ways, at different times and with different people. It takes a lot of introspection and understanding to be able to identify that perhaps this is trauma showing Sometimes up. Sometimes it's too, um, too difficult to relieve. Yeah. Sometimes it's, I mean, rape. You don't want to relieve it. Mm. You don't even want to remember it if possible. So denial is not going to work. Yeah. But many deny. Yeah. Why do they deny? Do they understand what it means, the, the, the ripple effect? Do they understand the consequences? Of so un unfortunately, clearly, a lot of people do not understand that the things that we shut out, we keep in boxes, and things that we have cleverly dealt with will show up and rear up their ugly heads later in life. I guess we weren't clever enough. <laughs> and so denial, and I'm happy that you mentioned denial, is what we refer to as a defense mechanism. A defense mechanism is an unconscious impulse that we use to cover up what we don't find, you know, pleasant, pleasant mm. to us. And in Nigeria, denial is one of the, de um, the defense mechanisms that we use. Denial, for instance, you go to a hospital and you say, oh, madam, your BP is high. You know what people will say? I reject it. <laughs> denial. <laughs> Repression is also one that we keep away. Putting things under the carpet. We know what so, happens. Sorry, the, the, the BP one that you just... <laughs> can the person know it? <laughs> but you know how it is. We don't, we don't want to accept reality as it is. We have a problem accepting reality because sometimes reality is too distressing to accept. And so people would rather push away what they don't want to accept. Pushing it away, however, allows it to transform, become you know, more monstrous. One day, it will show up. Okay. And so regardless of how difficult it may seem, I would encourage that as much as possible that we face and confront our fears and our traumas. Sometimes people have so repressed it that relieving it sometimes is unreal. Um, someone has been raped and the person has so pushed it back that it's unimaginable that it really happened. In that kind of situation, when the person has successfully forgotten the reality of it, what are the consequences and how can that person come back to the reality and deal with it? So when you talk about forgetting, forgetting for a while, yes. You had mentioned PTSD when you spoke earlier, a mm. post-traumatic stress disorder. We'll come to it. Yes, we'll come to it. <laughs> and so what happens, especially with sexual trauma, is that it is lined under so many layers, layers that make you think that you've forgotten. Sometimes it may be the, how someone touched you or what someone says to you that wakes it up at the end of the day. It is difficult, especially when that trauma happened not just once. Again, it can be once, depending on the age, who it was that enacted the trauma, where it was that it happened, who you spoke to, and whether or not they believed you when they, you said you know, what you said. Or did it happen a lot of times, process trauma. Sexual trauma almost always happens from trusted individuals, people that people know. And that makes it more difficult to you know, deal with and more difficult to even want to relieve or heal from. So many things would affect whether or not an individual wants to face their trauma, but no matter how cleverly we think that we have shot it out, 
trauma will always show up. And how do we make sure that the consequences are not grievous? Uh, well, sir, the consequences will come. The consequences will be grievous or not, depending on how ready we are to take it on. Are we ready to face the reality of what has happened? Are we willing to talk about it? You know, usually when people come to therapy, quite a number of people think that one session and that's it. It's costly. Mm, well, it is. <laughs> but so is it on the therapist's psyche and mind as well. Yeah. Because it's, you know, a lot of emotional turmoil sometimes. I mean, we also have to go for therapy. And so the consequences will come. I describe coming to therapy sometimes as a chicken who comes looking all well. And when you're leaving therapy, you're all ruffled. Or the chicken mm. comes in looking all ruffled. And after therapy, you come out looking well. Mm. The consequences will show up. It will show up with mood disorders. It will show up sometimes with personality problems, relationship issues, you know, inability to be productive even at work, inability mm. to manage stress, inability to solve problems or even take decisions. It would mm. show up. If it doesn't show up cognitively, causing either depression, anxiety problems, it would show up in inability to regulate or manage emotions mm. or generally how people behave with each mm. other. You may find that people who have been traumatized are more likely to be loners, socially isolated, or they are described as promiscuous, you know, going above and beyond, overcompensating because they couldn't control what happened to them. Yeah. Doc, you, you've spoken about therapy, therapy, therapy. Yes. Um, in our society, when you say you're going to see a therapist, yes. the first thing that comes to their mind is, ah, that person is mad. <laughs> You're going to see a shrink, yeah. therefore you are mad. So um, how easy is it for somebody who's traumatized to actually seek help and not want to hide the fact that they are seeking help for a mental problem that they're confronting? So I think that beyond the fact that the term appears to be like a buzzword, you know, at some point it became, oh, I'm in therapy, oh, I'm in therapy, and everybody wanted to sound like they were in therapy. You also actually have people who have serious issues who want to see therapists. It's a personal decision. It's not one that, you know, it's not one that I have to keep encouraging you come to therapy, come to therapy. I will encourage you to come to therapy if you need to come to therapy. But it takes a decision that I need this thing and I need to get it. You need to get to that place in your mind where you want to come to therapy by yourself, not because someone else is pushing you, but because you're beginning to see the signs of distress show up in your life. You're beginning to see that you can't relate well with people either, you know, without shouting, losing your cool. You're beginning to find out that you are having problematic relationships. Certain patterns are beginning to show up in your life. Until that individual sees the need to come in for a therapeutic session, it might be difficult, you know, to get them in. The general, you know, um, environment is changing. The attitude of Nigerians is changing. These days you have people call you up and say, or I'm having problems with my boss, I want to come in for therapy. Or I'm having problems managing my child, I want to come in for therapy. Or I'm having problems with my spouse, I want to come in for therapy. You may not even get people who are telling you, oh, I'm hearing voices or seeing strange things. People are beginning to realize that even with significant life changes, loss of a job, inability to get a promotion, difficulty in marriage, difficulty in relationships, these are the issues that people should bring to therapy. It's not until, you know, we find someone who is disheveled looking, walking on the streets, that's mm. not the only thing that we manage in therapy. Mm. We manage even seemingly little we'll, life We'll, we'll talk about that marriage thing some other time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Doc. Yes, um, I, I've often heard the expression that next to losing a spouse mm. or a child or a sibling, the next most traumatic thing for the human being is moving house. Yeah. <laughs> How true is that? <laughs> so, you know, when, I look at, when we look at wellness, we like to look at wellness and what we call the eight pillars of wellness. And so whatever problem an individual brings to me in a therapy room, I would be able to pin it in one area of the eight pillars. Mm. Either it be physical, financial, spiritual, social, environmental, intellectual, you know. You'd be able to piece it somewhere there. Um, I don't know what research that states, but I know that moving is a significant life event. Not just on an adult. I mean, you leave everything, you leave the comfort of everything that you're used to. You leave life as you knew it and you're moving somewhere else. You're moving, you know, you're moving your mind. You're moving physical things. You lose things. I, I move, when I move, I don't like it. 
because there are boxes that for years I will not touch. True. Exactly. And I would, I, I would just leave the room as it is. Sometimes, you know, thinking about who to call, how to call, what to move, it can be traumatic. Mm. It can. It is. It is a significant life event, so, and just just because it doesn't impact one does not mean you know it cannot impact someone else. I wonder how Abraham must have felt. <laughs> he had to move to a place he had no idea <laughs> of. You mentioned PTSD the other time. Uh, can you want, you want to tell us a little about that one? Okay, so PTSD is an acronym, and the meaning is just the Post Traumatic Stress Disorder. It's an anxiety disorder. Quite a number of people don't know that it's an anxiety disorder. So people just talk about it as if it's an entity on its own. But it's an anxiety disorder. Anxiety, like we know, is a normal response to a threat. However, when the threat is minimal, when compared to the response, or the response stays on, even when the threat is gone, you have an anxiety disorder. An anxiety disorder, of course, will increase in intensity, again, frequency, and cause distress, not just to the individual, but people around the individual and the functionings of the individual. A post-traumatic stress disorder happens when there's been an exposure to a significant stressful life event. Significant enough that the individual doesn't have the skills to cope with it, and the individual also finds it distressing to their life. What happens majorly is that it could be a war, it could be a road traffic accident, it could be sexual trauma, it could be, you know, being um, held at gunpoint. It could be being kidnapped. Armed, armed robbery. Armed robbery, exactly. Mm. We remember the 9-11 attacks and how it was said that both the people who were involved in the attacks and people who even went to rescue them, the rescue workers, also had PTSD for so many years. And so usually what you have when you have a PTSD is that there are a couple of symptoms which in involve, include rather re-experiencing the traumatic events, either through flashbacks, vivid memories, the individual finds that they are avoiding reminders. And so if it is a place, if it is a person, if it is a process, they try as much as possible to avoid any reminders of the event. Mm -hmm. And last but not the least is that you have what is called hyperarousal. And so whenever the individual has a memory, a thought, something that reminds them, they go into what is called an, a hyperarousal state. The heart beats faster, the respiration is faster, the GIT system is faster, the mind is racing, and all of that. So, these are all of the symptoms you have when you have a PTSD. Okay. So is it possible, and we, we don't have much time, but is it possible to be 100% done or free of trauma? So again, you know, I'll take you back to what I said earlier. Not everyone who faces a traumatic experience comes down with a, you know, um, a, a lifelong, exactly, a post-traumatic stress disorder. Some people have what is called an acute stress reaction. Some people have what is called an acute stress disorder. Some have what is even called an adjustment disorder, which is what is likely to happen when you move. But when you have a post-traumatic stress disorder, chances of getting better is much improved when one, for instance, you seek help early. So that's one of the things. Number two, you don't have any previous experience of trauma. And so imagine that somebody is perhaps an oil worker, and has gotten kidnapped not once, not twice, not. <laughs> the chances that that individual wow. will heal from that PTSD. Is that person a customer or something? <laughs> it's not unfortunately, unfortunately, it's the reality that we sometimes see. And so traumatic PTSD may not be 100% cured, mm. but an individual's ability to function or reintegrate properly back into the environment is better when they give themselves opportunities to heal from the trauma. And the earlier you try to heal, the better. Quick one, we have just 60 seconds. Parents who have children suffering from trauma or PTSD, how do they deal? Accept that there's something going on. Accept that you don't have to wait until that child is exhibiting behavioral problems. If a child is telling you, I'm having nightmares, or you've noticed that that child is becoming withdrawn, isolated, not doing as well as they did in school before, regressing, perhaps bedwetting when they had reached an age where, you know, they had achieved control. There's a difference between the child you knew and the child you currently have. Seek therapy. They're child therapists, and they're child therapists who would help the child deal with whatever traumatic experience that the child is going through. Mm. Let's just say that we just, we only barely opened... We're on page one. <laughs> no, you mean preface. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> but we, this is a conversation we most certainly will continue, you know, because okay, if you can give a quick start, mental health issues, how serious is it in our world, especially in Nigeria? Well, back burner issue for a long time, but now we're seeing it everywhere, every day, in almost everything that people do. They're very serious. Mugbojibala Abiri is a consultant, psychiatrist, and mental health advocate. Mm. Just consider this part one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for, so much for your time today. Thank you very much for having me. Okay. Well, one of the ways in which people deal with issues such as this is to listen to music and sometimes to words on tape, such as the one we'll be talking with on our home stretch after this break.